Can we take those for future use? Uh, no, you, what, you mean replacement parts? Yeah. <laughs> no, these are probably, they've got to be, I mean, I got these from a retired chiropractor. He probably had them for a while, and I got them in about 84. So they're probably upwards of 50. They've been out of the body as a skeleton for probably 50 years or so. So here's the atlas, here's the axis, and here's C3. You can see there's a difference between the atlas and the other bones, obviously. And then here's the rest of the cervical. And you can see that as you go farther down, this would be more of a typical cervical vertebra versus this is starting to look more like a thoracic. Actually, this might even be T1. But this is starting to look more like a thoracic vertebra versus a cervical. But as you can see, this has these uncinate process, right, those, those little tips on the joint. I mean, on the vertebral body, you can see this one doesn't have one, whereas this one does. So this is probably C7, this is probably T1. I don't know, there's another in between. Anyway, I'll pass these around. So like I said, if you got problems with it, just pass it on to somebody else. So how many cervical vertebrae are there? Yeah. And how many nerves? So what we'll be talking about today is the cervical spine and then also a little bit about TMJ. So you divide the cervical spine into two different areas. You have the upper cervical spine and the lower cervical spine. Okay. When, you, when you can do different motions in the cervical spine, if I'm doing this, what part of the cervical spine am I moving? If you feel it, yeah, it's up. Because if you feel it on your neck, you mostly train right there up at the top. Right? So, and then all the the majority of rotation occurs between C1 and C2. So basically, the, you divide the cervical spine between the upper cervical, which is the occiput, C1, C2, and the joints between them. And then lower cervical is C3 to C7. So then that shows the difference between this upper and upper and lower cervical spine. Okay. And then we'll break it down between the different joints. So you have two joints in this upper cervical spine. You have between the occiput and C1. Okay. And what kind of movements occur between the occiput and C1? Rotation. Actually, you don't. The rotation is the, lo the lowest amount that uh, it's there. You hardly have any rotation at all. You can have flexion extension. Okay? You can have a little bit of lateral flexion. Primarily it's going to be flexion extension, a little bit of lateral flexion, and pretty much net nothing on the rotation part. Okay? So here it's showing flexion and extension. And then here on this last one you can see there is some lateral, lateral bending. Not very much though. And then it's a condyloid joint because it's got the two congruent surfaces. So you do have two planes of motion usually, but not typically not three. It's just in the same way that I mean, you can't really rotate at the wrist. You can flex and extend, you can laterally bend, which is ulnar radial deviation. So it's similar to the occiput, except you don't have very much lateral flexion. It's primarily flexion extension. And so then there's where you have between C1 and C2, you're going to have primarily is rotation that occurs there. Okay? But half of the rotation that occurs in your neck comes happens between C1 and C2. And then the rest kind of function all together. C3 to C7, because of the plane of the facet joints. If you look at these facet joints here, they're, they're more or less in this type of arrangement. Right? They're not completely horizontal, they're not completely vertical. They're sort of at an angle back like this. So what happens is that they move, it's a combined motion like this where you have rotation and lateral flexion occurs together. Right? And you can have flexion and extension like this, but lateral flexion and rotation pretty much occur together as a group. It goes like that. And you can see where it, where it stacks up like that. It's going to be a combination of lateral flexion and rotation. 
there is a little bit of flexion extension, but for our purposes we'll just consider that it's a single plane joint, so it's rotation. Okay. So that's a pivot joint. And then here we're talking about the three different joints between each vertebra. We'll talk more about that in a second here when we talk about the vertebral motor unit. Okay. Basically what you're doing is dividing, you have this one dividing point right here. The line is along the back side of the vertebral body. So there's one joint between the two vertebrae and the anterior motor unit, which is basically going to be the intervertebral disc. Right. And then what's this part in the middle? Nucleus pulposus. And then what's this on the outside? Annulus fibrosis, right? Annulus as in rings, fibrosis as in fibers, because there's crisscross fibers in there that form it. So then also, what's in terms of ligaments, what ligament runs along the front here? What's the word for front in the anatomy? Anterior. What's the word for something that goes up and down all the way along the length of it? But on your GPS, what does it measure? It's the two things. Latitude and longitude. So in this case, we're talking about longitudinal, so we'll call it anterior longitudinal ligament. Okay. And then if we had one on the back side here, what would we call that? Posterior longitudinal ligament. Okay. So when, when you move, the vertebral body moves, in, the anterior motor unit is moving at the disc. And then that leaves everything back here for posterior motor unit. So how many joints are there in the, at one level in the posterior motor unit? Oh, that's, what are they? There's three or whatever. What are these right here? Set joints. How many on each level? Two. So the, the vertebral motor unit is three joints. One in the front, which is the disc, and two in the back which is the facet joints. So between each vertebra, there's three joints. One is an anterior motor unit, which is the vertebral body, I mean the, the disc. The vertebral bodies on the disc, and then the two ligaments, anterior longitudinal and posterior longitudinal. Then on the back side, you have everything starting from here, which is, it's what you call the neural arch. When you're forming the neural arch, you have two things that come back from the vertebral body. Do you remember what those are? Another word for foot? Well, that's way up at the top. Right? <coughs> Here's the vertebral body with the two things that come back here. It's a word for foot to begin with a P. Okay. Pedicle. Okay, then you can have a transverse process coming out here, and you can have the articular processes, and then you have. So that's the neural arch, it's what, surround, it's what surrounds the spinal cord. Okay. And then you have the facet joints or the articular surfaces. 